Do you have a paranormal encounter you'd like to share with us? Send us an email with your story for a chance of it being featured on Weird World. Julia DeMant was an orphan. She had been kept at school till she was 18, then removed just at an age when a girl starts to take an interest in her studies and not regard them as drudgery. On her removal, she had been plunged into the world of society. Then suddenly her father died. She had lost her mother some years before and now went to live with her Aunt Elizabeth, Miss Fleming. Julia had been left a sum of about £500 a year and would probably inherit a good estate and further funds on the death of her aunt. She had been well treated as a girl at home, regarded as a beauty at school, and was certainly intent on making the most of her bereft circumstances. Miss Fleming was an elderly lady with a sharp tongue, very outspoken and decided in her opinions, but her action was weak, and Julia soon discovered that she could bend her aunt to do anything she willed, even though she could not modify or alter her opinions. One day saw them arguing about Julia's intention to attend the county ball as they sat in the carriage on their way. Aunt Elizabeth was still strongly arguing against it. Her reason was a tragic string of events which had led to the untimely end of a young man named Mr Hattersley. Aunt Elizabeth blamed Julia for leading him on, in the belief that she liked him, then throwing him over as soon as the Honourable James Lawler had appeared on the scene. The coronial verdict had been that the young man had taken his own life when in an unsound condition of mind, and Aunt Elizabeth was adamant that it was Julia who had upset him by refusing his proposal of marriage. She had already blamed Julia for another delinquency in which she had lured on, then refused, a suitor who had ended up marrying a girl greatly beneath him in social position. She accused Julia of wrecking two men's lives, while to attend the county ball would appear callous. Julia was particularly anxious to be present at the ball, for she had already been booked by Mr Lawler for several dances, and was quite resolved to trying to bring him to a declaration of love. Julia now insisted to her aunt that there had never been an engagement and that she bore no responsibility for either man, including the condition of mind that had led James Hattersley to do the dreadful deed. She said that while she felt very sorry for his family, she gave him no further thought. Julia had hardly spoken the words when a chill wind began to pass around her. She drew her shawl closer and, complaining of a draught, asked if the window was down on her aunt's side. The window was secure, but the wind continued to blow harder and was deadly cold. It increased in force, now plucking at her shawl, then tearing at the lace on her dress. It snatched at her hair, wrenching it away from the pins and combs that held it in place, one long tress lashing against the face of her aunt. Then the hair, completely released, eddied up above Julia's head and drifted across her eyes, blinding her. Then came a sudden explosion, like a weapon had been fired into her ear, and with a scream of terror she sank back into the cushions. Miss Fleming, in great alarm, motioned for the carriage to stop, and the footman brought the lamp. Julia was lying back, white and senseless, her hair and the flowers and pins in it scattered throughout the carriage. The horses were turned for home, and the doctor sent for, as Julia revived, asking if her aunt had heard the explosion. Miss Fleming had neither heard the explosion, nor even felt the wind of which Julia had complained. On arriving home, Julia rejected her doctor's opinion that she was hysterical and needed something to soothe her nerves. She was satisfied that she had definitely experienced the retort of a gun and the rushing wind which had ripped her dress as if by hand and completely dishevelled her hair. She was vastly perplexed by what she had undergone, thought and thought, but could get no nearer to a solution of the mystery. The next day, almost feeling herself again, Julia received a visit from the Honourable James Lawler. 
He expressed disappointment that he had not seen her at the ball, and said he and others had wondered if she had absented herself out of grief for Hattersley's passing. This she denied, saying that she had found James Hattersley nice enough, but she had never cared for him. Lawler probed further. One lady had told him that Hattersley had proposed to Julia. Was there any truth in this? While thinking his question impertinent, the moment she uttered the word no, there sounded in Julia's ear a whistle of wind and her hat flew off as she felt a current like a cord of ice creep around her throat, increasing in force and compression. The next instant a detonation rang through her head like a weapon fired into her ear. She cried out and sank upon the ground. Lawler and the butler carried Julia inside where she came to in her bed, and again her aunt dismissed her claim of hearing a gun discharged. Putting it down to earwax, she offered to syringe her ears with warm water. Julia then confided that she was sure the awful noise she heard was to do with James Hattersley. On both occasions that she had heard the agonising blast, like her skull was shattering, she had been speaking of him. Perhaps this was what he had undergone in his final moments. She now remembered what he had said the last time she had seen him. He had left her in a state of great agitation, vowing that she would not forget him, that she would belong to no one but him, alive or dead. Although at the time considering his statement great nonsense, Julia now felt that these phenomena were coming from him, that he felt a malignant delight in distressing her from beyond the grave. She was determined to defy him, but could not bear any more of these experiences. Mr. Lawler called repeatedly to inquire, but a week passed before Julia was sufficiently recovered to receive his visit. While physically better, her nerves had had a severe shock. Now, while in mortal terror of a recurrence, she felt a deep resentment of Hattersley, that a disembodied spirit should hover about and make itself a nuisance to the living seemed unthinkable. A few days later, she was in the conservatory when Lawler again visited, offering a bouquet of flowers which Julia said would bring her great pleasure. At this point, Lawler said that the great object of his life would be to bring her pleasure if she could give him hope, whereupon he drew near and caught her hand, earnestness in his eyes. At once a cold blast touched Julia and began to circle around and flutter her hair. Turning a deadly white, she trembled and drew back in dread of a renewal of that paralyzing experience as she put her hand to her ear. She begged Lawler not to speak, as she was not yet well enough to hear it. The following day, Julia received a note containing a formal proposal from the Honourable James Lawler, and by return of post, answered with an acceptance. There was no reason for a long engagement, and plans immediately began for the trousseau and wedding. While still nervous when alone with James, at times feeling the wind curl around her, Julia hoped that with her marriage the vexation would completely cease. On the day of the wedding, many friends and neighbours watched as the bride proceeded down the church aisle to the sound of the organ, and the ceremony began. As the couple spoke their words, a cold rush of air passed over their clasped hands, numbing them, and began to creep around the bride and flutter her veil. Julia tensed, thinking that in a few minutes she would be beyond the reach of these manifestations. But as she began to firmly speak her vows, the wind became fierce, raging about her and twisting her veil around her throat. But she persevered to the end. James Lawler was about to place the ring on her finger, speaking his vows, when the blast rang in her ear with that shattering sensation, and she sank unconscious on the chancel step. In the midst of profound commotion, she was lifted and taken to the vestry, followed by a trembling and pale James Lawler. He had slipped the ring back into his waistcoat pocket. As Julia lay in the vestry, to the amazement of those present, it was seen that, on the third finger of her left hand, 
was a leaden ring, crude and solid, as though it was fashioned out of a bullet. After a full quarter of an hour, Julia opened her eyes, but as she raised her hands to wipe away the damp on her brow, her eye caught sight of the leaden ring. With a cry of horror, she sank again into insensibility. The rector announced that it was impossible to proceed with the service that day, and the wedding coach now conveyed Julia, hardly conscious, to her home. No rice could be thrown, the bell ringers departed, and the reception feast was consumed by the kitchen staff. Julia could not speak for several hours, but when she did, confided to her aunt that she could never marry Mr. Lawlor. She had made her vows to a James, but it was not he. At the time of his responses, she had heard an unearthly piping voice in her ear saying the same words. When Mr. Lawlor had produced the ring, there was the explosion in her ear as before, and the leaden ring was forced onto her finger, not Lawlor's golden ring. She had married James Hattersley. She was a dead man's wife. Years later, Julia was still Miss Demant. All attempts to remove the leaden ring had always caused her the shock of the explosion and her collapse. She invariably wore a glove on her left hand, bulging over that third finger. Although her aunt had left her a handsome estate, she was unhappy and entertained a deadly hate towards the memory of James Hattersley, as well as Providence, for allowing the dead to walk and molest the living.